All right, let's take a confession today. One to go. As I said to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. Amen. That's great. The timer came on late, so I got more time. I didn't tell you folks your time I was on. Okay. I got it because I have a long way to go today. All right. I want to share on and what I want to speak about um, is how to uh, writing out your confessions or scripting your confessions. I want to speak about that. Now, tomorrow, right, uh, or not just tomorrow. Well, other services today, um, the QR code or the link to the training for um, masterclass. I said that, and it will be on. Let me just look at the date here. It's going to be a Saturday, and it will be Saturday, the 16th of July at 7.30 a.m. for about two to three hours. It will be a masterclass. All right, so let's get into it this um, today. Uh, we've said faith is the substance of things that you hope for, and we've described uh, what hope is, and the fact that hope is an expectation that you have in your heart based on a promise that God makes to you. Uh, so God makes a promise to you, reveals what he intends to do in your life in response to a particular situation or in response to a desire or aspiration that you have in your heart, and he gives you his word. I said that creates an expectation on the inside of you that is no longer based just on your own desire that is the outcome. It's not based on, all right, just your aspiration. It's now based on God fulfilling his word. God using every resource and ability that he possesses in order to honor his word in your life. So if I promise you a certain amount and I say to you, come tomorrow at 12 noon after you ask me for that amount, what I am saying literally to you is that I will go into my resources and at 12 noon, I will give you that set amount or else, all right, you can question my own ability or question my own willingness to help or to show love. So we saw in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 13, Talking about this, because I want to get into something, I just want to lay this foundation quickly. Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made promise unto Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying that surely blessing will I bless thee, multiplying will I multiply thee. And after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Then it says, for men verily swear by the greater, and an, an, an oath for confirmation is to them the end of all strife. So God willingly more abundantly to show to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. 
that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge, that's to God for refuge, to lay hold upon that hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and enters into that within the veil. So let's assume you asked me for 250,000 naira. And I say, come on Monday morning at 12 noon to the office, and I will give you 250,000 naira. You're getting the 250,000 naira is no longer dependent on your own ability or your resources. It's now dependent on my own ability and my own resources. So once God makes promise, he's saying, now you can depend on my power and my resources to get it done. But I say come tomorrow at 12 noon. So you come boldly at 12 noon tomorrow and you get to the office because you have an appointment. And that appointment was created by the promise that I made saying a come at 12 noon to get it. So what it tells us in verse 19 is that this hope we have as an anchor to our soul, both sure and steadfast, and entered. I mean, there's no confidence if you're just coming at 12 noon, if there's no appointment for you to come, they are going to enter into the office. But if I said come at 12 noon to get 200,000 or 250,000, you come boldly because you have an appointment. And so God says, my office is within the veil, therefore come within the veil based on the appointment I have given to you by the word that I gave unto you. And what are you coming to do? Verse 20, it says, those of us who have fled from refuge, sorry, verse 19, those of us who fled from refuge, oh, sorry, verse 18, it says, which, that my two beautiful things in which it was impossible for God to lie, those who have fled for refuge might lay hold upon that hope. So you leave your house to come to the office to lay hold upon that hope, all right, that has been set before you that you receive within the veil. So he said after God makes promise, he's not telling you to go and try and get it done with the brilliance of your own ideas or through your own network. It says, what I expect is what you will do if somebody says, come and receive it tomorrow at 12 noon, and you go to that person's office to get it. So you come within the veil that is into the office of God to lay hold on it. And we said from Hebrews 9 and verse 15, what you are going to lay hold on is that they which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So you are going in to receive God's promise, which is, we explained, if somebody says, come for a car tomorrow at my office, and you come, and the car costs 10 million, and the person gives you 11 million for that car. The person hasn't given you a physical car, but the person has given you the equivalent with extra in order for you to now go and make an exchange outside that office in order to be in physical possession of that car. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So when you come in, you lay hold on the eternal inheritance, which is the promise of the Spirit, in order for you, all right, to have the equivalent, so you now go out and out of your belly flows rivers of living water, because you came in to drink, and now out of your belly flows rivers of living water, that gets the job done. We saw the mistake Christians make in their thinking 
is that they think, first of all, some people don't even go into the holiest of all to receive it. And that place is miraculous. All right, Bill Brian, who my preachers for Brother Copeland, she said once, I mean, I've talked about this, she has a camp, what's called a prayer village on, on, on a place called Mount Ozax in, in the States. And when she was going to build it, she doesn't have a church, it's just a ministry. She said, uh, she, when God gave her the vision in one of the conferences, she was so deep in worship that God said, I am going to get this money, all right, to you. She did not tell anybody about the project until it was about 75% completed. The money was coming in supernaturally. You get what I'm saying? Because God knew and God moved people to act in a certain way. Now, we don't put our trust in that experience that produces miracles. We go on the outside and say, well, I have a promise from God. And then we begin to put people under pressure. We begin to do things on the outside with just our own brilliance. And then, as Paul said, haven't begun in the spirit with revelation. You are trying to perfect it in the flesh. So he said, you go in, and the Spirit is imparted. So you become a different person, and the Spirit manifests himself in wisdom or and in power to get that particular job done. So you are involved. So if a person says, I'm working in a place, my goal in the next three years is to rise, to become the chief operating officer in this establishment and looks into the word of God and gets a promise from God, which is there in so many ways. For he has given you the earth, this material world as your inheritance. So you get a revelation there and say, this is what's going to happen. God says you do not have to now start manipulating the environment. Uh, 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 backstabbing people, trying to, you know, uh, and do all of that. Come into my presence with that promise. I will impart my spirit into you. Wisdom will enter into you, rare insight into things. How to treat people right. All right, how to speak and the level of your intelligence and your abilities, or I will go on the increase. Till it will get the attention of people that are in authority as it was with Joseph, it was with, with Jacob, and with Daniel, that they had ten times more understanding because of the spirit that was within them. And then you begin to rise through that system there, and there will be things and obstacles that you will meet, but you will rise through all of that, rise and get to that particular point. But it's not going to happen by an incompetent person just being invited one day to become CEO. Do you get what I'm saying? All right? You'll start rising. Okay? So if you're done in three years, God will put you on a three-year plan. That three-year plan can, can lead you to go and do some courses in some places. He will lead you and say, listen, you need a mentor in this area and open up a very strategic mentor to you. He will lead you and he will get you a sponsor in your career. All right? He will lead you and bring books that will open your mind. And then the Holy Spirit will help you interpret. So stuff will be going on. Now, what I want to share today is the condition that must be satisfied in order to have a transference of the Spirit into your heart, which means there is a divine protocol you must follow when you are coming into the presence of the king. It is written in the New Testament as to how you ought to come in if there is going to be the reception of that eternal inheritance. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 and verse 23. 
It says, let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And what I want to talk about is verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. The word profession comes from a Greek word which means saying the same thing as. That is your confession. Let us hold fast. So saying the same thing, all right, without wavering. The confession of our faith without wavering. For faithful is he that promised. In other words, if you are going to come in and you are going to have a true impartation on the inside and you receive that inheritance, you must hold fast the profession or the confession of your faith without wavering. I mean, you will not like it if you promise somebody 250000 and say you can come in on Wednesday to get it. And the person spent all of their time before Wednesday telling people how they don't think you're a very faithful person, how they don't think you have the ability to get it done, how they don't think that you're going to keep that word and all of that. You, you, it will change the way, all right? It might change the way, all right? It will probably change the way you're going to treat that person, and that person may just not get it again. Do you get what I'm saying? If somebody comes up to you and shows you a conversation they had with the person that promised you, and in that conversation you see it, that the person says, well, this person is not trustworthy, and I don't think this person is capable of solving this problem and all of that, and you read it, you may just drop that phone and say, listen, forget about it. Do you get what I'm saying? And God did say that to the nation of Israel. He said, for these things that you said, murmuring and complaining, he said, you will know the breach of my promise. I will change my mind concerning you. So the confessions that you have before the time of prayer determines what will happen when you enter into the place of prayer to see whether there's going to be a transference into your heart. Remember the woman with the issue of blood. Let's read our story, Mark chapter 5 and verse 27 and 29. She had a confession of her faith that determined what happened when she made contact with Jesus. Jesus has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we go up to the throne of grace, we are going there to meet with Jesus, and he is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And he says, listen, the woman with the issue of blood came and received an impartation of the Spirit. That's why Jesus said, virtue and power has left me. All right? Now, there were other people that were touching Jesus, and virtue and power did not leave them. Did not leave Jesus into their body. And some of them were sick. And they went to Jesus and they were holding and touching and nothing was transferred. And how do we know that? Because Peter said to Jesus when he said, somebody has touched me. He said, there are several people thronging around you. What Jesus was saying is somebody has fulfilled the conditions through which there will be a transference of virtue and power into them as they make contact with me. So you can get into the place of prayer and you're not making vital contact. That is, you can be going through the motion there of prayer and there's really no vital contact that you're making with God. So the woman said in Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 29, a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. 
When she heard of Jesus, the hope was created. She came in the press behind him. The press means the multitude. And touched his garment. For, she said, before she touched his garment, she had been saying, if I may just touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And the Bible says, and straight away, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. But before she made contact, she was saying, literal Greek says, she said within herself. She was saying it within herself. It was a confession of her heart that she verbalized and was saying it silently as she was going through the press. And she was the only one with that confession based on what she had heard. And when she touched Jesus, there was a transference of it. Now, if you waver, which means you are not consistent in that confession. So your words are being determined by the environment and not the revelation that is in your heart, which means that you see other people touching Jesus and nothing happened. So you start saying that nothing is happening and nothing is happening and it's no longer what God showed you, but what's going on on the outside that is it's actually fashioning what's coming out of your lips. When you make contact, there will be nothing. And let me show you this. Look at Numbers chapter 14 and verse 27. Quickly, we're reading 34. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, say unto them, this is a law, as truly as I am alive, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so, so will I do unto you. Now, they didn't go to God and say, God, I'm saying this into your ears. Do you get what I'm saying here? These were conversations they were having, murmuring about what was going on. But God is omnipresent, which means anything you are saying, you are saying it into his ears. So if you are complaining inside that office where you are believing to become the chief operating officer and you are complaining about what this person and what that person and what that person did there, then God is hearing all of that. Then you get into the place of prayer and you say, let God and pray. Prayer there when it comes to the manifestation is to cause the confessions that you have been making, what is in your heart to come to pass in your life, all right? And it's not going to produce anything that is not in your heart. So see what God did to them. Look at the next verse. God said, what I heard them say, so will I do. Look at what happened. They said it. So God said, that's what's going to happen. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number, from 20 years old upwards, which have murmured against me. Doubtless. Huh. For God to tell you without a shadow of doubt. Doubtless. You shall not come into the land concerning which I, which I swore to make you dwell therein. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Next verse. It says, quickly, it says, But your little ones which you said shall be a prey, then will I bring in, and they shall know the land that you have despised. Next one. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and bear your hordoms and until your carcasses are wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you search the land, 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even for 40 years, and you shall know my breach of what? Promise. In other words, I made the promise, you will know what it means to break the promise. That's why I said if somebody begins to, and they show you the chart, it changes everything. In other words, I made a promise to you to come and get the 250,000, but all you have said about my character and my own ability and called it into question by this chart has reversed my willingness to give you that amount of money. 
So you've got to have a solid confession without wavering. What does it mean not to waver? I'm getting to the message now. It means that you are not double-minded. Put James chapter 1. It says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Uh, verse, verse 5, from verse 5. It says, let that person, if any of you lack wisdom, there's the spirit that gives wisdom, this is what he's saying, yeah? Let him ask of God who gives to men generously and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. You see that thing again? For he that wavereth is like the wave of a sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's when he prays. Look how he says it. For a double-minded man is what? Unstable in his ways. I hope you know he's in prayer. He's saying, let not that person who is praying think that they will receive anything of the Lord. Do you see it? So there are conditions that must be fulfilled when you get into the place of prayer. And one of these conditions is, all right, you must have a solid confession and you are not double-minded. Now, this brings me to the point. The Bible didn't say you are not triple-minded. It didn't say you are not quadruple-minded. He said you can't be double-minded because what he's talking about are two minds that exist within us. And this is what I came to share today. You have what is called your conscious mind. And then you have what is called your subconscious mind. There are two parts of your mind. I should have had that thing of an, a ship and an iceberg. You look at the iceberg there, it is the tip above water. But the solid mass might be on the water, and you are looking at the iceberg and think that can take this out just an iceberg, and you don't know that the greater mass is underneath water. Same way your subconscious is where most of the stuff is. What you are consciously thinking and purposing, all right, is very small. Now, what you've got to understand is this what determines your destiny because the children of Israel did not get into the promised land, not because of the presence of giants on the outside, but because of unbelief on the inside. In other words, they were what? Double-minded. It wasn't the giants that stopped them. It's not the condition of this country that will stop you. It is whether or not something has happened on the inside of you. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19, why could they not get in? It says because of their unbelief. So it's not the presence of giants on the outside, but the limitations on the inside that we call unbelief. And it's with this confession and the work of the Holy Spirit you will deal with this unbelief. And, and it's at the subconscious level. All right, and that's what they asked Jesus. What must we do to do the works of God? He said, "If you will believe." So where you have no alignment between the subconscious and the conscious mind, and I explain what I mean by this, it is impossible to get results. If I intend to become the CEO in four years, and my subconscious is saying something else, and most of the time that's what's going on, all right, it's never going to happen. Now, if my conscious mind says it, and my subconscious mind is in agreement with what I am consciously saying, nothing on the outside can stop me from getting there. You have the confession of your mouth, which is what many people call confession. But there is what the Bible calls the confession of your heart. You may be saying something with your mouth, but your heart is saying something else. Don't you know the scripture? That they honor me with their lips, but their heart is what? Far away from me. This is what we're talking about. That's why the Bible says it starts. The righteousness of faith starts with the heart. We'll see this. Say not in your heart, which means you can say things in your heart. 
Now, many people, their heart is saying something else, but their mouth is saying something else. And let me just quickly show you what your heart is saying. If you say, I'm going to lose weight, and I'm going to lose 10 kg in the next four weeks, and you look at it and say, all right, this is the routine I'm going to have. I will exercise, I will change my diet and everything. And then you say it consciously, all right? Three hours after, somebody brings some massive cake with ice cream, and you are there eating it. That is the confession of your mouth. The confession of your heart is we are getting fatter. Do you get what I'm saying? If you say that, listen, I'm going to be trained and all of that, and then you are sleeping and the alarm goes on and says it's now time to go to the gym and you turn around, what you said last night was the confession of your mouth. <laughs> what you're experiencing is the confession of your heart. Until you bring that, all right, logic is found in the conscious mind. Habit patterns is what you have in the subconscious. If you align both, nothing can stop you. And I'll show you that's what Christianity is all about. That's why Jesus, when Peter said, I will never deny you, Jesus said, chief, you are saying it consciously, but your heart is saying something else. And I'm just telling you where your heart is. You will deny me thrice before the cock crows. Romans chapter 10, verse 6 and 8. Look at both confessions. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy what? Heart. So it's a confession that begins in the heart. Verse 8. It says, But what say thee? The word is nigh thee in thy mouth and in your heart. So there is the word you can say from your lips, but for it to work, it must be on your lips and it must also be the confession of your heart. Once we can establish this in one year, everybody will be a spiritual giant in this church. Once you understand how to align E.W. Kenyon said, once the heart and the mouth are in agreement, unprecedented power is released through prayer. One time, Dr. Creflo Dollar said, you want to know how we build this faith dome? One time I was teaching. He said, it's about the agreement between the heart and the mouth. It's not about the money we had in the bank, but whether our heart was in agreement with our lips. And you find what is in your heart in those conversations you have every day. All right? You can be in church and say, I'm a miracle going somewhere to happen consciously. But you are programmed, God forbid, as a failure. That will so, do you get what I'm saying? So what happens is that first challenge that comes, you back off. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. Isaiah 29 and 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near me with their mouth, with their lips, do they honor me, but they have removed their hearts far from me. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 4, quickly. It says, Speak not thou in thine heart. You see there. Which means your heart can do what? Speak. When the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, it was saying, he will say unto you, eat and drink with the mouth, but the heart is saying something else. There's no alignment. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 21. So you say with the heart, and if thou say in thy heart, if you say, the Bible says this, in your heart, which means your heart can speak. So you may be saying something consciously with your mouth, but your heart has some other thing for you, which is what's going on. And your heart always has something for you. All right? This is why, and we've said you can vow to lose weight. You can say something logically, that area, but you contradict it the next moment with your actions. Your reasoning... Is the conscious part, your habits that you do on auto at subconscious level, 
All right? That's the subconscious part. So you know what? You can have a habit pattern and say, well, I am going to get a job, and you are confessing you are going to get a job, but the, the patterns that are in you at subconscious levels always, always will sabotage what you have consciously said. So it's called self-sabotage. So how do we erase that? Romans chapter 7, this was the problem that Paul was talking about in verse 19 to 25. Romans 7, 19 to 25. He said, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For to will, for I find the law that when I will do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of the Lord after my inward man. But I find another law at war in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me to the law of captivity of sin, which is my members. O wretched man, he said, this that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? He now said, I myself, I thank God through the Lord Jesus. So then with the mind, I myself, that mind is talking about that subconscious level, serve the law of God. So here's what happens when they say unbelief. A person can be in unbelief concerning something, but it's consciously saying, I will get it. Mark chapter 9, verse 23 and verse 24, when they were trying to cast out the devil from that boy, and the father ran to meet Jesus in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, if you can believe, just look at it this way, if you can be in perfect alignment in your heart and mouth, all things are possible to him that does what? Believes. Just look at it that way. Then the boy said the right, or the man said the right thing. Straight away, the father of the child cried out and said in tears, Lord, I do what? I believe, but help thou my own belief. Which means consciously I want it, help to change my subconscious. Now, because of time, I can't say this, but if you read Hebrews 4, it says they couldn't get in because of unbelief. Then it comes in and says that, let us therefore come to the throne of grace that may obtain mercy and find grace to help. What that grace does is help you with the unbelief. We think it's help on the outside, but it's to help you come into perfect alignment. That is there. So, how do I get this done and begin to work with the Spirit? We'll continue next week. I'm, I'm, couldn't get into details, but let's look at it. So build a confession that will communicate at subconscious levels. And that's what I want to show. And this is what I'm going to be doing in Mastercard. Build a confession that will, all right, communicate or from your heart that will communicate. You see, your habits, they are based on the experiences you have had in the past. Your limitations are the experiences you have had in the past. What you have not experienced the subconscious has to be trained to receive it. Do you get what I'm saying? Or else it will sabotage you. So build a confession that will communicate with your subconscious heart and align it with God's purpose that you know consciously. The key to that is repetition. Now, let me give an example so you understand. If you are learning how to drive, you are using your conscious mind. That's why you can be sweating, you hold on to the steering wheel. You get what I'm saying? And you are doing this. And if somebody's playing music, you say, look, let me concentrate. Don't, don't talk to me. Let me concentrate. You get what I'm saying? Yeah? Let me concentrate. Let me, and you're looking at, let me concentrate. And you're doing that. But after some time, when there's mastery, that means it has gone to subconscious level. You, they will have, they will have to use the law to keep you from eating on the phone, listening to music and driving. The person can almost put their elbow and say, don't worry, nothing will happen. And they're talking because your subconscious has been trained. Do you get what I'm saying there? When you are trying to learn a language, you'll start with your conscious mind. After some time, you just get it at that level. Do you get what I'm saying? That's what Jesus was saying. He was talking about the kingdom. He said, we are going to that subconscious. He said, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, drink. He says, did you take thought? Were you conscious 
of your growth when you are growing effortlessly. Once you take something out of that consciousness and put it there, then you are going to begin to get supernatural results. It is a method we want to teach. Repetition, therefore, is the key to the subconscious. I mean, how do we know this? I mean, you may not like it, but if I tell you nursery rhymes now, blah, 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 shit, no, you don't have to think about it. It's in your subconscious. Do you get what I'm saying here? Yeah, there's something you learned consciously yesterday you are struggling to remember, but something that when you were a child, it will be coming out of you flawlessly. I mean, I was watching a competition in Kedja Center where they were having um, nursery rhymes. I couldn't believe it. And one people get, no, no, I forgot it. But once they start, you two will remember me singing with them. So you have to make your goals so powerful that distractions, your distractions don't interfere with them. I want to show this. Through repetition, you get it integrated into your being. This is how you learn things when you are a child. So write it out. We saw last week as what you call a story of what has already happened. Describing it. I mean, look at John 17, verse 9 to 13. When Jesus was calling those things that be not as though they were his high priestly ministry or his high priestly prayer, Jesus was still with his disciples. Look at how he prayed. Quickly put it up. John 17, John 17, 9. I pray for them. Now, he was in the world with them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are dying. Verse 10. All are mine, and are mine are dying, and I'm glorified in them. Verse 11. See what he says. Now I am no more in the world, but he was still there. But these are in the world, but both of them are still in the world. But he was praying, calling into existence, because these were the words that were going to be used for his resurrection. Holy Father, keep through thy own name those which thou hast given me, as they might be one, as we are one. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, but he was still there. He was talking about the next experience as something that had already happened. So because of time, let me just put the four points. Sit down with your target statement, which means write it down, number one, and sit with the target statement. It must be definite, which means there's, a, there's something you are you're reaching for. Choose a time where you're going to do this, when you're not going to be disturbed with external things. Phones off, TV off, nobody. Folks, if you are doing this thing and somebody else is in another room making noise, they will interfere with the communication between your conscious and subconscious. Do you get what I'm saying? If music is being played, it's distracting you. Are you following me? Then as you're making the declarations of this, promises here, imagine the experiences, we said you talk about that image part, as you declare them. Now, this is where the discipline is, and let me just tell you this, this will show whether you make it or not. Sit with it and try and repeat it, as you're reading it, to yourself in one sitting, 50 to 100 times, if you can do this. Hey, you don't make up. 50 to what? A hundred times. Because what's going to happen is you are going to pick up on the conflicts inside your heart to that thing. And if you resolve those conflicts, you are going to receive inspiration on what to do to make it happen. But we'll talk about this in the master class. Notice the areas of conflict where the statement doesn't sit well with you. And then you begin to edit. God is stop here because of time. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for your word this today. I ask by the power of your spirit that this word gets rooted inside our hearts, expands within our consciousness, and brings forth good results in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You know, there was a story of a man who went to teach in a success seminar. And when he got there, he sat down. And a gentleman came and said, you know what? I am going to speak. Let's say the man said was Mark. Just before Mark, I must make sure I keep to time because every time I speak, I always speak beyond my own time. And then after he said that, he started speaking and he was checking his wristwatch and checking his wristwatch to make sure he stood on time. 
By the end, he now looked, said, wait a minute, he looks at my rituals, I stopped and asked him. It was only 10 minutes left for the other guy speaking time. He said, I'm so sorry, I'll get down. The other man came and said, I can tell you in 10 minutes from what happened, what I was going to teach. This man's subconscious has been trained to always take the time of the next speaker. So even when he consciously did not want to do it, his wristwatch stopped working so that what he was programmed to do would come to pass. That's what it means when people are lucky. They are programmed for those events. It's a subconscious that kicks in. We'll see at the master class, but we'll still preach next week. God bless you all.